problem of physics is to what extent is my measurement interference? Yeah. And does it make events in nature observable? And then if I, if I, if there, there have been people who have, who have like, I mean, I don't know whether quine is that bad, but there's a tendency, but there are others who have done this, to derive nominalism from this. And to say because, because the world depends on our observations, yeah. I, um, I, the, the point is, of course, the consistent history approach acknowledges measurement. And we will see how they do it uh, either at the end of today's session or tomorrow, depending on how fast they progress. But basically, um, but basically, um, uh, um, but basically, it is true that there is interference. However, the problem is still because all the time, there happen, there happen um, events in nature which resemble the disturbance that occurs when we do measurements. That, that, that's now, there, therefore, the breakdown of the wave function cannot only happen when, um, when I do a measurement, mm -hmm. but it must happen all the time. That's, and that's the argument given by, um, by Penrose. So he believes that the wave function is breaking out down all the time. But that's also strange. So, so, um, but but in the, but that is that is indeed the argument that's given. And well, but if there's friction everywhere, or if there are things yeah. bombarding each other, as there are in yeah. every part of the world that we're familiar with, then the wave function might be collapsing all the time. Yeah, but but then it is not a very good. Um, then it is not a very. How does it get restarted? It's it's just not a very good theory. It, it seems quite artificial. So, so basically, but we still, we will still pursue this now further. So, this projection postulate raises problems on its own and can't be right. So now we look more at projection. So, first of all, the concept of measurement issues uh, in an observer necessity issue here. Yeah, but the theory that is supposed to explain the fundamental properties of matter cannot be observer dependent. Yeah. So this was the argument against von Neumann, because von Neumann said, "Oh, we can only." wave function can only get, get a people result if there's an observer making a measurement, but then it was argued that but then we will basically, uh, we can't explain fundamental properties of matter if we need an observer, because of course not matter also works without observer yeah. And so then, um, uh, um, but then GRW, this is the ones I just mentioned before, and I think Penrose says, yeah, but we can also use this axiom without measurement. We can just say the wave function collapses all the time by itself. That's Penrose's argument. But in A5, the state psi A is not dependent upon T. So there is no psi A of T. So there is no parametric rule that describes how the state switches from psi of T to psi A. That's quite an obviously very bad, very bad mistake, right? So suddenly, this is like picking another wave function. It's not anymore the wave function that I have before, right? And so and it, is, it, it, it doesn't even depend on T. Yeah, so this is very, very strange. So if, if now T is a starting point and T prime is a, is a breakdown point, so how is this T, which is a breakdown, to be chosen? This is an argument from Carsten Hell. The collapse is modeled as an instantaneous process with a clear starting point. So, so it goes from, it, the starting point is T from psi of T, but it has no end point. So how do we select the end point? So if we say t comes before t prime, then the process of changing t to t prime is not instantaneous because it's smaller. So there is no breakdown of the wave function if, if we have no instantaneous, instantaneous switch from t to t prime. So then it's like the wave function is always running away from its own collapse. That's what this says. And if we make the collapse instantaneous and say, okay, we now let t equals t, then we have a system that is in the initial state, and it's a state of the collapse of the wave function at the same time, which is also impossible. So that really means that logically, A5 can never be right, not even if we postulate that it happens without measurement, wherever there are changes, state changes in the quantum system, that's how the Penrose is able to postulate. So this really means that the whole idea is logically inconsistent. So you should be aware that the same argument can be applied to any kind of causality. So let's suppose we say that event E causes event E prime. 
then does E cause the E prime instantaneously? If yes, then at that time t, the system is both in E event and in E prime event, which can't be true. So, this so does it take, is there a gap between what um, here um, becomes uh, in a way more severe? So the classic argument against causality, you can always say that there is a, that there is a more subtle chain and, 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 and you could, yeah, that's a classic argument against this is infin infinitesimal uh, approximation of the causal chain, right? But, but here you can't apply this because you have the wave function. So it's, it's worse than with the classical argument against the wave. But I agree what you're pointing out that Carlton Head is, is free riding a bit on, a, I think the argument is Leibniz and Aristotle, it's a very old. And, 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 uh, and, and Head is a bit free riding on it, but nevertheless his argument is very strong and very good. And, it's, and there is no way to escape from the argument given the nature of the wave function. So, so what Carsten Held says basically that A5 is a wrong mathematical wave. And so, what, so the results given by the Schrödinger equation cannot be applied to a single event. Is, is that really true? So let's look at this. So the square of the output of the Schrödinger equation gives us the probability. We all agree on this. But the single polarized photon passes the filter or it does not pass it. So the Born rule, so I have a, that reads like Jason Born, should do that. Now we know what you read. I, I actually, I only watched the movies. I think that I watched quite a lot of the class, <laughs> so trashy, their language and the, the people running around in these novels are made of plastic, so you can't really read it. <laughs> but, but I watched the movies with great pleasure. So the Born rule to compute the probability is only, is only valid for many measurements, uh, so a distribution. So Bell says, and he was, a, he was quite an important uh, theoretician of quantum mechanics, either the wave function as given by Schrodinger equation is not everything or it is not right. So um, uh, um, I think um, it is not everything and it is not wrong. And, oh, it is not everything. It's right for the situation for which it was done. So because of this, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen formulated in 35 a very famous paper in which they showed that quantum mechanics, or they said quantum mechanics is incomplete, there are hidden variables, the equation is correct but incomplete. And then de Broly, de Broly a very, very, uh, of the first generation quantum mechanics, also a very, very important man, and at a bit later, Bohm proposed an alternative to the Schrödinger equation by adding a Guy equation that determines the location of the particle. So it, it, it's mathematically very elegant, so the, now there's a the second equation, and they are combined together, they give the location of the particle. But the theory is incompatible with the theory of relati relativity. So it's non-local. So it means, um, so, um, uh, uh, so, so, it, so it means that, that uh, you, ca you can't, um, uh, it assumes effects that are not, not happening locally. And also, um, it's also incompatible with quantum field theory. Why is it incompatible with, with theory of relativity? Because of the non-locality, and therefore it's also incompatible with the Dirac, uh, the Feynman quantum electrodynamics. Therefore, Feynman rejects it, of course. Um, uh, I think only in a footnote he really um, is very, very dismissive about it. And, and I mean, basically, he says implicitly that Bohm was nothing. And, and, um, and as, as so, so was Spinoza. There are, lot, there are lots of nutter geniuses. Yeah, but I don't think Bohm was a genius. I don't think so. I, I, I think it's. it's uh, because his, his solution is obviously uh, nutty. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not in accordance with all the rest of the knowledge we have, so it can't be a good solution. So, uh, so geniuses don't invent such, such pseudo solutions. It's also incompatible with quantum field theory because, um, because it, has, it has particles and quantum field theory doesn't have them. It has no traction in modern physics, and some philosophers who believe in non locality, they really like it. Yeah. And then there is the third one, is the consistent histories approach, and it was developed by Gelman, Hartle, Griffith, and Dominus. These are the real four most important. Yes, sir. So I think you should just say a little bit more about what the thesis of non locality means. It means that something could be happening on the moon now which causes Ali to type the letter M down here. Actually, that still would be possible, theoretically, because it's the moon is far mountain. enough away. And so you could still think with the signal. Okay, then you get a, give a good example. It, it come, it's coming later. Okay, all right. So, um, so but, but, but the problem is really, is really how do we deal with the superposition of the states? 
that's what this says, yeah, because this he describes as a superposition. And how do we deal with this? And th that is really a big problem. And now, so I want to, before I go into all this, I want to, there's a very useful um, article by Baldwin, whom I bashed yesterday. Ali had this book about quantum mechanics, but he has also a good paper in the Oxford Handbook of Metaphysics. He has a paper of Metaphysics of Physics. I think the paper is not very strong, but he, he lists six issues of quantum mechanics. And I think, and we can, I want to review these six issues with you and then come to those two issues that really are a problem. But it's really worthwhile going through all six. So you can, so this is, a, you can, the source is, um, so if you want to read one single paper that showing you, that shows you um, the, the mainstream view, it's this. Distilling metaphysics from quantum physics in the Oxford Handbook of Metaphysics. By the way, it's, on. It's, it's here in the library, you can, you can read it. Um, so the six issues he's, he's, um, he's going through is, and in, on four of them I, I agree with him. First is determinism. So people s tend to say that quantum mechanics is not deterministic, but that's not true. The Schrödinger equation is deterministic. The fact that it only describes stochastic distribution means that it is incomplete for single particles, but not that it's indeterministic. This is very important. So if you look at the double slit experiment once more, this is a distribution. That's what nature is giving us. So the, of course, the equation can al also only give us this. Yeah, so it, it's not, it's, it doesn't mean that what's going on here at the double slit is not deterministic. It just says that, 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 that we get the waves. Yeah, and so we need the model that also gives us the waves. So thinking that it's not deterministic is wrong. The, the idea that quantum mechanics breaks the deterministic world view is nonsense. Already classical mechanics cannot make predictions for many mass masses moving together in a common gravitational field. So I can't, when I, have, when I have masses which, and I want to model not only have one big mass and several smaller masses that are drawn towards it, and I, I want to model this properly, I also have to model the gravitational forces of the masses to each other. I cannot only work do pairwise the big mass A with B and A with C and A with D, I also need, need to model the mutual uh, um, the gravitational effects of the uh, smaller masses. And, if in, and that's the reason, for example, you have all learned that the, the Earth uh, um, uh, uh, moves around the sun in, on a trajectory that is, an, that is an ellipse. It's almost a circle, but it's, it's an ellipse. And so that's not true, it wiggles. And it wiggles because there's gravi gravitational force by, but, but the, other big planets that are close to the Earth that also have gravitational effects on the Earth. And so this wiggling of the Earth is never modeled, right? You, it, and it cannot be, it, it, can, it, can be, it can be modeled roughly, but it's, it's something that is, that, that uh, Newton's equation and the whole celestial mechanics that we have uh, does, doesn't take into account. Even our models, when we launch satellites or so, don't use it. So it's, it's but it is, it is because it's only very tiny, but it is there, and so that shows that the, the ellipse that, that Kepler and Newton described is just an idealized shape. It's not the real shape. And so, and so that I'm giving this example to show that even the strict determinism that, in which Lagrange believed, for example, or Laplace, is actually wrong even in classical physics. Uh, so, so uh, hang on. Uh, the fact that we cannot make predictions may be a, a result of our having uh, mathematical uh, resources which are too weak, that does not imply uh, the absence of determinism. Yes. So, I'm, so I so I agree so completely, so it, I, what I really want to, want to say is that the model it doesn't guarantee determinism, but, but we don't know whether the world is deterministic or not. Yeah? And this is also what Kant, this is Kant, a very strong, uh, pa Kant's, Kant's passage about, in, that's the third antinomy, uh, which I mentioned <coughs> yesterday in the morning, it's really worth reading because there Kant proves that we cannot, using physics, we cannot know whether the world is deterministic or not. And but but saying that that the Schrödinger equation is not deterministic is just wrong. But th this is what I'm saying: here. physics does not help us to answer the question if the world is deterministic because its models are not applicable to the natural world uh, in in in, the, in most situations. So the, que the question remains metaphysical, and this is very important. So so why do we still ha need to have a philosophy department? Because there are quite a lot of questions which we can't answer with physics. So the philosophy department and doing philosophy is needed to, to, to basically 
um, mm. cope with the world, um, <coughs> despite the fact that we cannot understand everything. It's just, I think this is, uh, there's a very nice passage in John Searle, which Barry and I cite in our book about on, on AI, where, where, where Searle says that, the, that in, in theory of science, the role of philosophy is to, ha to, to point out what the gaps are and to deal with them in a rational way. So then the second, the second pro problem here that moderns bring up is de determinateness. So what is the characteristic of a particle? And um, so, and he just, it's, it's not, we, we will see that this is basically, can be answered by saying that quantum mechanics only enables us to speak of particle probability distribution and not about the, 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 the exact characteristic of a particle. So, the, so in other words, the fact that the photon is a superposition state between two horizontal polarizations, the X polarization and the X prime polarization, when it flies through after it has flown through the polarizer. Um, th that, that, is, that, uh, that allows us only to speak in a sensible way about its, uh, about its inducing probabilities, and, and we just have to accept it. Then we have observer dependence. So quantum mechanics is not observer dependent. The issue is settled in our work of uh, interpretations by now. So even now, <laughs> the modern projection postulate, which is in itself wrong, does not need an observer, as uh, Penrose pointed out. So now we have, we have one more that is that I want to briefly discuss before I go very much in more detail to number four and six. So that's logic. So does quantum mechanics empirically invalidate classical logic? So or I think for Neumann, um, in, proposed a new logic. Yes, it was for Neumann with, I don't know who was the other guy. Proposed a new logic that should replace classical logic. So to make it fit with quantum mechanics. And, um, and they, they believe that quantum mechanics empirically invalidates classical logic. They seem very, very attractive to people like Popper, Quine, and Rawls. So Quine mentions this, for example, in Two Dogmas of Empiricism, and, and uh, Popper mentions it all the time, but it is wrong. It is a mistake to think that the trip proposition that the particle passed through the union of two states is the same as a disjunction of the propositions that it passed through the first or the second. So disjunction means it passed through this or through that. And basically, the, the, um, the proposition that the particle passes through the union is, is, uh, is not the, is not the um, so, so Merlin says facts about unions are not just disjunctions of corresponding facts about the parts which comprise them. I can even say it in a much simpler way. And the much simpler way is, you can see it here, it's this. Yeah, so, so if, if, this, if, if our logic would be wrong, if I would allow to add those two, but I can't, I need to add first the amplitude and then do the square, so I get this term with the cosine that we saw yesterday. That's all. You get what? The cosinus term. The, this, is, this, this, this leads to the You, you have to say term. cosine. I tried. I just <coughs> failed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so this yields this three term, because bin binomial formula. And so therefore, this here is not the union of these two. Right? So it's, it, and, and this, if you want, if you look at this, then the old Popper, Popper was so stupid, he couldn't even, bloody hell, he couldn't even look at this equation. This is so simple. And even this, he couldn't understand. So then he starts to talk about quantum mechanics. And this, I must say, I really hate, and it, it just disgusts me when philosophers do this, because this is even my, my 11-year-old daughter could understand. I think if I spend enough time with her, I think so. Yeah? And, 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 sure. and let alone all my other kids who are older than her. Yeah? And so, so it's, 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 it's just, it's just it, it shows just an unwillingness of philosophers to, to, to carefully deal with, with those facts. Now, are you blaming von Neumann here no, or Popper. Maudlin? Popper. Or Maudlin? No, Popper. No, Maudlin sees it exactly as I do. Okay. He thinks it's total nonsense that, that, Good. that logic breaks. So then von Neumann made the mistake. No, von Neumann, von Neumann didn't make a mistake. He, you, if you look in deeper into this, he wanted, he, he was, he, it's actually, you can see what he did with logic as a precursor of consistent history. I see. But it's just much more complicated than that. So we can't go into this, but, yeah. but uh, Griffith is, is a big book of Griffith. He explains this, so he does justice to von Neumann. But, but basically, but basically, but th these, these very bad philosophers I've been listening which are, I think, I mean, the, what is so terrible about them is that they are, not broadly, but Popper and Quine 
are, so to speak, in the analytical theology tradition. They are part of it now, and they are skeptics, right? And it, 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 it has driven, and this whole idea that, that, uh, that quantum mechanics is, it validates logic is very dangerous. So basically, the probabilistic reasoning required in quantum mechanics is, is fundamentally different from plain classical propositional logic. And, and what they, that, that's for Neumann recognized, and he just developed the new um, uh, uh, probabilistic reasoning, that, but that was not, not right yet. So you can't do everything. Also, for Neumann was a bit, I mean, I'm, I'm two or three classes lower than for Neumann in terms of the intellect, but you are, what, what I, in which respect I resemble to him, that I tend to get interested in different topics and skip, jump from topic to topic and get bored with the topic. Neumann was also a bit like this. He never worked on a topic for more than two years and he went to the next topic. So he didn't think this out fully. But, but basically, but basically the, 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 inter, the interference wave pattern is not a union of a single particle and particle in the two slits. We see I said that the two slit experiment shows that the wave function is different when both slits are open from the function we obtain when one is closed. This has nothing to do with classical logic. Popper, Coyne, and Rorty simply did not understand the mathematics of quantum mechanics. The irritation about quantum mechanics supported the anti-rationalism. That's really it. And then you have this, I, I think we barely explained to you the anti-rationalism of Popper, Lakatos, uh, and, and the worst one is Swiss, uh, what's his name? Uh, Wieder die Methodenzwang. Feierabend. Yeah, Feierabend. He's an Austrian. Not uh, he's an Austrian, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's the Austrian bad guy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they were all bad guys. This group. Oh, uh, Popper, Lakatos, yes. I forgot and one. Feierabend. Kuhn. And Kuhn. Uh, no, Kuhn was an American. Yeah, but he was a bad guy. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but Papa, Lakatos, and uh, Feyerabend all came from the former Austro-Hungarian. Yeah, Lakatos is Hungarian. But, but basically, but basically the, the irrationalism, very often they all use quantum mechanics. Feyerabend, uh, also, uh, by the way, Kuhn uses quantum mechanics to, to, to support his silly idea of the paradigm shift. So, so this is, so when you hear quantum mechanics cannot be uh, addressed with logic or breaks logic, that is just nonsense. It's just that you have to apply a different logic and propositional logic doesn't work. It's simple propositional logic, but it's, but it's, um, but, but that, that, that has only to do with probability theory. theory. And, and, and again, if you look at this here, this is just a probability theory rule that you have to know and then, then you're good on this. Now let's go to the more difficult stuff. The two things that are open is uncertainty and entanglement. And also non-locality. And so now we go into more of the depth of this. So Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, hey, Jobs, just yeah. before you go there, uh, so Ma uh, David Malament has a paper on how uh, the, it's a short paper on how the quantum uh, the, the connectives in quantum logic are not truth functional, and therefore we would need a new like new. Uh, Interpretation or is a new way to approach them. Have you like? Yeah, but I that? mean, in the end, it's just read Griffith. Yeah, I mean, well, ch chapter four, five, and six are only about this: how you have to, how you, how you have to adapt, how the the adequate stochastic logic that is to be used for quantum mechanics looks like. And it is interestingly, it is just plain stochastic logic as you learned when you learn stochastic. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, it's linear algebra. Like when no. you want to numerical numericalize no, it, algebra. but no, it's not linear. Algebra. It's stochastic logic. This is what you use also in Bayesian inference mm. whenever you do probability theory. So this has not really much to do with linear algebra. Linear algebra is the way that the states are described. But 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 the linear algebra is very distinct. So to, to get the book, I mean I can only recommend to you because you're advanced already, you should read the book by Griffith. This the quantum the mechanics of Griffith. Right? Yeah, it's or is it another book? Well it's it's this the it's the what was it called? I will give you the yeah, 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 sure. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I know. So, um, so, so, um, and, and this treatment by Griffith, with regard to the way the logic notation should be done, and what are the reasons, the rules for reasoning, that is absolutely undisputable. I mean, that's rock solid, and and anyhow. Now, we can never know the location and the moment of a particle with the same level of accuracy. We've learned this yesterday. We've seen this, this uh, derivation of this rule by the slit topic. Uh, within quantum mechanics, there are different ways to show and derive the principle. Um, and does the principle mean that the particle cannot have both an exact momentum and location at the same time? Um, well, what it means is the following. First of all, 
quantum mechanics teaches us that we cannot really know the nature of a particle from physics, which, which, which we also see in the next section. The Schrodinger equation shows the particle as a wave and struggles with its nature as a particle. Second, our modeling ability of the quantum world is limited to use the data with the machines we build to do quantum experiments show. So we build machines to do quantum experiments and then we derive our models from these machines. But our knowledge of the quantum world is so to speak limited and incomplete. The uncertainty principle illustrates this. It is an important epistemic principle of quantum mechanics, but it's ontologically quantum is I think zero. And the reason for this is the following. The reason why we have uncertainty and why we have all these strange quantum mechanical phenomena is that because we can only see a small part of the quantum world by doing the experiments we do. They're always partial. And because they are so partial, we, we, we don't get full answers. Yeah? Because this world is, is to, to, in its completeness, is not observable by us. So what, so, this, so what about entanglement? So entanglement is a special state of superposition. So, so let's look at this. This is very good. This is also from this short modeling paper that I've cited. Um, but there are other good treatments of entanglement. So this here is singlet entanglement. So we have entangled particles that can be prepared experimentally. For example, you can take a photon. One photon with high energy. It has spin one. And now you can use a technology called spontaneous parametric down conversion to generate a pair of low energy spin one half photons. So now you suddenly have two spin one half photons made of one photon. And so um, they, here these particles are superposition state. So that means, so this is, this is um, the state in which they are. And this is the cat. And now you see here, this is just a normalized factor, but you see here now this spin A is is uh, in up, uh, sorry, this particle A has spin up in the x direction, and particle B has spin down in the x direction. Um, uh, um, sorry, th th these are the, the base states. So this is the base state of being up in x direction and down in b, in, uh, and for the second part, be down in the direction. This is the other, um, the other um, state. This is, by the way, the tensor product, and it's very important we get to the tensor spectrum which I know work in a bit. But this essentially shows that, that you can see that the spins of different particles are complementary, right? And um, so, so they are superposition state. So, um, so if we now measure for particle for one particle spin up, like measure it and obtain this then we will always obtain spin down for the second particle. And if we measure spin down for the first particle, we will always obtain spin up for the second particle. Even if they are so far apart, so if you have prepared the two photons with the technique uh, of, of spontaneous parametric <coughs> down conversion, and now kept them kept in, a, in, a, in a trap or somehow kept them and transported them away from each other so far that, that, that um, when we make the measurement, there is no chance that the light can travel to convey some information to them. Now we measure the first particle, we will always get, upon measuring the second particle, the opposite spin. That's called entanglement, even if they're very far apart. The, and now, interestingly, here, the second uh, entanglement state shows an entanglement of, um, of, z, of the spin along the z-axis, the z-axis. So this is again entanglement, but it's a different angle. Now, if we would measure on one particle z-spin, um, uh, we can we can we can only obtain the entanglement on the other z on the other particle also in the z spin. But if we move, if we measure now the other particle in the x direction, we don't know what we will get. So basically, so basically that's very important. So 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 this measurement, if we measure on the first particle, it's spin up. We will always get on the second particle the spin down. But if we measure spin z, z direction, so you remember the three directions the coordinates have spin that direction spin up, and then x direction spin in the other particle by turning this Stern-Gerlach apparatus around its angle to get a different, a different uh, magnetic separation. Then we will, then we will, um, of the photon, of the photon, then we will, um, uh, we don't know what we get. So they are, so these two are mutually exclusive. One can only measure spin in one direction for the pair, and that's an example for the uncertainty relation. These are again two complementary spin in direction x and spin in direction y. Only one of them can be measured at the same time. 
And is this an example of non-locality? Yes, so, so the entanglement seems to be an example of non-locality. The, 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 the fact that I can only measure the X spin or the Y spin or the Z spin, the Z spin is an example of the uncertainty relation, but the, but the fact that I can only measure that I, 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 I seem to be able to, to can predict if I've measured the first particle, what is the spin of the other? That's, that's, that's taking us to now to non-locality. So as long, but as long as none of the particles is measured, it's not clear which one has spin up and which one has spin down. Once one is measured, the state of the other is always the opposite. So this is this is entanglement, and this seems to say that that there is non-locality in physics, which would be terrible. Einstein, until his deathbed, he was fighting it with all the good he said. It. And what about you? I hate it as well. But, but successfully? It seems to be yes. Very tight, right? So it's very tight. No, it's, so it seems to be verified experiment. Yeah, the Nobel Prize was just awarded for one of these experiments. Mm -hmm. But the minority view is, is that it doesn't verify non-locality, but it verifies something else. Mm -hmm. and, and about this, we will, I will discuss this. Yeah. Wait, are you saying you don't accept quantum entanglement? Did I misunderstand you? No, I just it? have a different interpretation. I, not oh, me. Okay. Griffiths and Omnis have a different interpretation of quantum, and I'm just a modest consumer, but I subscribe to the, to the, to the view of Omnis and Griffiths. And they are, they are in the minority, but I think they are in the minority. But, that, but why are they in the minority? We can come to the fact come back to later. So particles can also be in the triplet state, which seems to indicate that not only they are, that also the principle of separability is not there. So this is also a passage from Morse. So what is a triplet entanglement? Triplet entanglement is the state here shown as three. <coughs> Both particles have the same spin. That means if one is measured, the other has the same spin. So either both are up or either both are down. Um, so an individual particle, um, um, so, so now that means that if we have a particle in this state and measure it, we don't know whether it is in, in singlet entanglement or in triplet entanglement with the other particle. Only if we measure the other particle, particle we see from the result, if the result is opposite to the first particle, then we have singlet entanglement. But if it gives the same result as the other particle, we have triplet entanglement. And so that means in the eyes of Morden that the individual particles can only fully be understood if the whole is considered. Morden interprets it as a form of holism. This seems to invalidate the principle of separability. So it says basically the, the whole is not made of, it, of its parts. By measuring this one, I cannot know what the whole is. Only by measuring also this one and finding it in an up or down step, I can find the whole. That, this seems to contradict the principle. Of, um, of separability, and this is as terrible as giving up the principle of locality. Both of, if we, if we give them up, we have completely a, a broken physics that is totally, totally in contradiction with common sense. And so, and so can this be right? Now, um, so, so Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen thought that entanglement means that quantum mechanics is incomplete. They believe that there are hidden variables that should be put into the Schrödinger equation, then it would become complete. And, and at that time, it was not a stupid assumption. Uh, it was said by Einstein. Um, but, it, it, but I think now we know it's wrong. And this is what the Bayer experiments show. They show that Einstein was wrong. But, but the mistake is not in the lack of variables. The mistake is in the view of the Hilbert set. And this is a problem. This we will, so, uh, so it's a mathematical problem and not um, and not uh, a, a problem of physics. And this is, this is very, very important to understand. Now let's go through the argument. So in a certain file, Einstein, Brodsky, and Rosen presented a scenario that involves preparing a pair of particles such that the quantum state of the pair is entangled, and then separating the particles to an arbitrary large distance, which is what we just uh, told you. The experimenter has the choice of possible measurements that can be performed on one of the particles. When he chooses the measurement and obtains the result, the quantum state of the other particle apparently collapses instantaneously into a new state depending upon that result, no matter how far the particle is far apart. So th this is what I just described, and that suggests that either the measurement of the first particle is somehow also interacted with the second particle at faster than speed of light, or that the entangled particles had some unmeasured property which predetermined the final quantum state before they were separated. And so this is, so, so I should, of course, says there is nothing that moves faster than the speed of light. When I make the first measurement, I cannot magically communicate the result of the first measurement to influence, so to speak, the second measurement. So there must be a property of the particles that is hidden, 
that, 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 that so to speak programs the way that they will be measured. And, and in a way, I also think that's true, but we can't measure this property, but philosophically, um, look, at, look at that. Or well, wouldn't party. that imply the ability to foresee the future? No, because you need to entangle the participants. So, so this is one of the basic problems with entanglement uh, setting, is that the entanglement is a preparation. It's not easy. You need to prepare the participants to become entangled. Right. Yeah, but so the, only then you can do a prediction. But uh, the idea of the hidden variable that you just described would suggest that we have to be able to foresee the future of the uh, particle that we can measure in order to prepare the other particle so that it gives a conformant measure in the future. Mm, no, the, the basically, ba basically, it's not foreseeing the future. When you prepare, when you do a an entanglement preparation, you know that the two spins of the, of the, I mean, you have to see what already, what a kind of cruelty you're doing to nature because you're taking a spin one particle and making it two spin one half particles at lower energy. So these are not natural particles, right? So these photons are pseudo photons. That's also an argument against these, this kind of reasoning. So now you, you take the artificially made pseudo photons of which you know they have complementary spin apart and now you measure one. So, but you basically, you know already, you have already prior knowledge in by, by the preparation process. So the preparation process itself is also weakness of the whole reasoning of that. Um, but, but let's continue a bit more. So I don't think that it has, it has to do with, with being able to, uh, so, so if I um, castrate my cat, it will not be able to have children anymore, but I'm not, I'm not predicting the future by doing this. I just causally prevent it from, from having children, right? And so, so this is not foreseeing the future. To, to stay, to, to use just like the, the cat example. Yeah. We will have another cat example soon. <laughs> so, so um, assume mechanics, the quantum mechanics must be incomplete, argue Einstein, Rosen, uh, and Podolsky, as it cannot give a complete description of the particle's true physical characteristics. In other words, quantum particles like electrons and photons must carry some property or attributes not included in quantum theory, and the uncertainties in quantum theory's predictions would then be due to ignorance or unknowability of these properties later termed hidden variables. And this is, this is um, the argument is in the end wrong, but it is right that quantum mechanics is not complete. However, it's a mathematic, it's a, it has to do with the mathematics and not with, with the physics as far as we can see. Now John Bell showed that for two entangled particles, one can measure the X spin of one and the Z spin of the other, so that no local measurement can determine the state of the system. Then he carried the analysis further and said he deduced that if measurements are performed independently of the two dispersed particles or entire pair, then the assumption that the outcomes depend upon hidden variables within each particle implies a mathematical constraint. So I repeat, if measurements are performed independently on the two separate particles or entire pair, the assumption that the outcomes depend upon hidden variables within each implies a mathematical constraint on how the outcomes or the measurements are correlated. And then the constraint is an inequality and he showed that quantum physics predicts correlations and violates this inequality. And therefore, he concludes that there are, that there are, cannot be hidden variables. Um, uh, or that there are non-local, yeah, which is somehow the two particles were able to interact instantaneously, no matter how widely the two particles uh, are separated. And so now, and this is what Tom said, many, many experiments have been done that show that even if the particles are far apart, that no information can be exchanged, you still have the entanglement. And, and still you have this problem that, um, uh, um, that, that quantum physics predicts correlations that violate the inequality. And therefore, you ha cannot have uh, hidden variables. And the reason is absolutely, uh, is, seems to be absolutely pristine and correct. Therefore, it's today the mainstream view. But the mainstream interpretation, see, and it sees it as a proof of the completeness of quantum mechanics that there are no hidden variables and believes that this means that, that, that there is non-locality in physics. So this is the, now the mainstream view. And this is the, the Nobel Prize was just awarded for another of these measurements that are technically very spectacular also. Now, th this is how far we get. So we are left, according to the mainstream interpretation of quantum mechanics, with an ontological view that we have non-locality in physics, so we can have effects causing each other at faster than the speed of light. So welcome to Star Wars, so to speak, <laughs> and, and with hyperspace travel. And that, and that we have, and that we have a non-unit, uh, sorry, um, 
non-separate that we have uh, um, that we have non-separability. That means that we have parts uh, which which not that that we that we we can't uh, anymore conclude what the whole is by looking at each part uh, on its own. So now we there's an, there's a, there's there are many there are some alternatives to this standard interpretation of quantum mechanics proposed by mathematicians. There's the Bohm interpretation, and there's the other one which is similar, which is the GBR from 1986, um, uh, um, which uh, um, one interpretation adds another guide equation, the other one adds a probabilistic term to the Schrodinger equation. Both have failed. Both are, so have failed. And then there are various philosophical interpretations. Most of them, um, not more than, but most of the others, um, or many of the others, show that the, those who wrote the interpretations didn't understand the quantum mechanics properly. So, yeah, like Popper or Quine. Now, now um, I mean, basic quantum mechanics, not the, the difficult stuff. So Feynman said that anyone who claims to understand quantum mechanics thereby demonstrates that they do not understand. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, 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 and uh, what, I mean, but I, what I mean with understanding quantum mechanics, understanding the mathematics as they are formulated. I don't mean understanding um, the, the problems because we will see that also this interpretation leaves problems open. So there, will, there are always ontological problems with quantum mechanics that cannot be gotten rid of. And when, when, when Feynman says this, he means that, that somebody who says that he has resolved all these problems that have not understood quantum mechanics. So it's actually, when you say uh, all the problems are resolved, you haven't understood it, but when you say p things like Popper says, you have understood even less. So um, let's look at the, there's, there's now this, this very interesting approach by Omnis and, and uh, Griffith. Barry pointed me to it two years ago, but, but uh, now I only had the time the last couple of months to really study it. Um, uh, so the, an overview of this is given in, is given in uh, a Stanford uh, uh, um, an Encyclopedia of Philosophy. In this entry, two M consistent history. The problem is, although this entry is 70 or 80 pages long, it is so dense um, that it's very hard to understand. And I think the best way to get to understanding consistent history is to first read Feynman's volume three, or Feynman's, uh, to understand quantum mechanics as it's classically described. And what is really good about Feynman is that he also doesn't talk about, he doesn't talk uh, about uh, the paradox very much. He doesn't talk about um, the, the um, uh, the measurement problem or, or the collapse of the wave function, he follows the rule shut up and calculate. Yeah, she just uses the mathematical tools to calculate probabilities and then he makes sober statements about probabilities and she just leaves the paradox aside. So it's quite good to, to understand what, what you can do with quantum mechanics uh, in, in, the, in, in its applications. You can understand this once you've understood this, then you, can, you, can, you could get the book by Griffith and read the book but the first pages of the book are also mathematically very demanding. But still, then you can understand this. Now, the, and I try to summarize it here for you in a less, less tough way. So consistent history's approach is, treats quantum mechanics as stochastic theory. Not just when measurements are carried out, but it's completely stochastic theory, which is, which is the right approach. So it even uses the notion of, um, from measurement theory, which is the foundation of probabilistic theory of, um, of, uh, of algebras. So he uses stochastic algebras to define the foundation of quantum mechanics. This is this they they were the first to do this. This is very very good. Um, uh, um, uh, so measurement theory is a sub branch of, of calculus, which you learn uh, when you do study mathematics. You have calculus one, two, and three, and in calculus three, which is the most advanced part of calculus, then you learn measurement theory. Or well, there's also calculus well, uh, and uh, yeah, that, that's where you learn. This is, this is the consistent history report. Then quantum properties, which are what pro the probabilities refer to. Quantum properties are associated with subspace of the quantum Hilbert space. So, the, so, so, so one point, as you will learn yesterday in classical uh, physics, is one dimension of the Hilbert space. And quantum properties, are still, and, and so if you have quant uh, compl more complicated quantum properties, then you have several of these vectors together. It's a, then a subspace of the Hilbert space. So if you have, so you can imagine the Hilbert space like a table, I mean a matrix, a matrix, and 
all the Hilbert space, all of it is just all the columns, and if you have just three columns, you have the subspace and that's then a property. Now the consistent history that Schroeder uses new logical principles to consistently deal with the difference between the quantum Hilbert space and the classical phase space. The new quantum logic reduces to the old familiar classical proposition logic in the same domain where classical mechanics is a good approximation to quantum mechanics. So this is shown in a very elegant way in the book that you can basically get back um, classical proposition logic in those cases where quantum mechanics aggregates to classical physics. And so Omnes, who was the, the other yeah. uh, great mind behind this approach, said that quantum mechanics actually proves the correctness of Newtonian mechanics in, in the domain that is relevant to human beings, uh, namely the, the domain yeah. of the life world. Uh, absolutely. So, so they both say, the whole school says, that quantum mechanics is everywhere and it just um, transforms itself into the deterministic case when the probabilities are either one or zero. And that happens when you look at the Hilbert space and you now you use, instead of very fine-grained vectors, you use broader vectors that encompass several of the quantum vectors. That's how it can be, I mean, roughly speaking. Now, look, look here again. This is, on one page, comparison of classical mechanics with quantum mechanics. And now you see why I introduced the Hamiltonian to you. So this is the Hamiltonian expression of Newton's laws of motion. You see here, this is uh, the location. Um, uh, uh, so this is velocity, and uh, because it's the derivative of, of rotation by time, and this is uh, acceleration, uh, uh, sorry, this is um, force, yeah. because it's the derivative of, um, so this is m times mass times velocity, and if you do derivative <laughs> by, by time, you get mass times acceleration, is, which is force, so that's Newton's second equation expressed in Hamiltonian terms. Here you have the Hamiltonian, which is in, uh, in classical mechanics just a function, now in quantum mechanics, because we have here an Euclidean space, here we have a Hilbert space, so the Hamiltonian is not a function anymore, but it's an operator. What is, what is the difference between a function and an operator? A function takes variables and spits out a scalar. An operator takes a, a vector and spits out a vector. So it's just, so, and you see it here. So, so basically, um, this here is a vector, a cat is a vector. This is just, I'm differentiating this cat. And now this just means if I differentiate cat by time and multiply it by these factors, it's nothing else but, my, but applying the operator to the cat, so I get another vector. So yes. Uh, so my, when people say you know quantum physics breaks logic, what I think of when the, what that makes me think of uh, as someone who hasn't read too much of this is like that last sentence right there. New quantum logic reduces the old familiar propositional logic in the same to, to a certain new restricted domain. Uh, that seems to me like the the idea that this you know line that it breaks breaks logic. Yeah, that seems like the idea that it's trying to get at, and you're saying that's going. No, I'm I'm, s I'm saying that John von Neumann, John von Neumann's statement that classical proposition logic cannot be applied one to one to quantum mechanics is of course true. He tried to develop an, a, a new logic for quantum mechanics, which was an extension of proposition logic, which was which was however incoherent. He didn't thought it, think it through properly. He did what, like the young man who comes to the Mayan astronomer in Feynman's video, so I can use it a second time in the video, who says to the young uh, uh, astronomer that, that, that his theory must be wrong because he doesn't get the right measurements. So, so, basically, so basically, for Neumann's idea was not formulated out correctly. And because it was not formulated out correctly, um, um, pseudoscientists like Popper took it up yeah, and said, oh, you see here, even we don't have no logic anymore. This is terrible. Uh, everything must be falsified. There is no knowledge, you know. And, and so, but, but this new logic is not really a new logic. So either in the, in the deterministic case, uh, I mean in the classical case where quantum mechanics aggregates to, to, to um, classical mechanics, it's again the old proposition logic. And, and when it is done, within the uh, within the uh, framework of quantum mechanics then it is uh, it is just stochastic inference as we know it from stochastic inference so if you take any handbook of stochastic in of, of, of stochastics or statistics you will learn the rules of stochastic inference and so it's basically what it only why it's a new logic because it combines it applies like the Dirac notation applies linear algebra to e functions that's what the Dirac notation does 
exponential function are summarized in linear algebra, in this in the same manner, uh, the logic proposed by Griffiths and Omnis applies, combines probabilistic theory with Hilbert space, uh, with Hilbert space function analysis. So that's all. And you can see this already. So, so anyhow, I, I, we will see what it means in a minute when we look at the rules. But basically, before we go there, I would like to highlight once more the similarity. This shows very nicely what is similar and different. So you see that here I have to differentiate the Hamiltonian. Here I'm, 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 I'm not differentiating the, differentiating the Hamiltonian, but if I want to get uh, um, uh, this psi t back that I have differentiated here, I have to integrate it. So I could integrate here, which we've seen before. We've seen that we can integrate over the Hamiltonian to get the inner product. Was here? No, you you put past it. Yeah, we could. Go yeah, forward. I don't mean this. I mean the inter yeah. yeah, we can see it here that we can integrate the inner product um, uh, uh, to get the Schrödinger as a, as a, as an expression of the Schrödinger equation, and um, here we now see um, that um, that we can also write it as a cat product instead of integrating. And um, so, so um, and here we see that the simple Hamiltonian for a particle moving in the x direction, which is that's a, that's a basic Schrödinger equation. But if we if we have more complicated Hamiltonians, then of course we get more equations. We're supposed to have a break at this yes, point. Yes, I think it's a very good point. Yeah. Another cat if we project this into this ray p. In Dirac notation, a b is an operator which when applied to an arbitrary cat, phi yields a cat. So here you see, I have phi, now I apply the, the operator, and now I get b phi, and can now write this cat a behind. So now I basically projected this phi cat into the a cat ray. So, so if you think of the phi as one column in the matrix, and now by applying the operator, now this phi is transformed into the, or projected into the A ray, which is another vector. And so, so this is how op what operated, and now what, what is incompatibility? Um, so the history's interpretation identifies P, and now you see, this addresses your question, identifies P and Q, which is the product, which is the logical end for proposition logic, with the product PQ of the projectors P and Q. Provided the two projectors commute, that is, if they are commutative, like here, p, p q equals q p. So that is the rule. So the logical n now becomes a multiplication. Yeah, and um, and you can see this in probability, probability theory. It's very easy if you throw two dice, and then you want to know the probability of obtaining the same number on on both dice. It's one sixty multiplied by one sixty. So the end is a multiplication. So this is very plain probabilistic reasoning. That's probabilistic reasoning. It's just the way you think about probabilistic experiments. And this was, I mean, the French were really good in the 18th century. Before they had the revolution and chopped off the heads of all the good mathematicians. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, I mean, you saw Lang was here. He, he was a, a, one of the best chemists of the 18th century. He was ex executed to death. And uh, the judge wrote, um, the revolution doesn't need chemists. I think, I mean. Let's not think about it too much. But 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 they, uh, they, they these guys invented um, Laplace and Poisson and these guys. They invented they invented all the, um, the important um, basic rules for for statistics, stochastic inference. Gauss then invented the uh, uh, calculus uh, of uh, of stochastic um, of stochastic. But they invented the, the, the reasoning, and of course uh, um, Bayes. Uh, another reason. Um, so, so this pro this product is itself a projector and projects into a subspace P intersect with Q, which is P intersect with Q is the set theoretical semantics of P and Q propositional logic in agreement with quantum logic. So this is a, this is a very I mean there's a bit more to it if you read the full book book you get more but but if P Q is undefined QP, the conjunction P and Q is undefined or meaningless. 
And this is, we will see this in the graph in a minute. This is very interesting. In other words, one cannot assign two incompatible properties to one quantum stiff representer. So when this product is not the same as, as its commutation, then there is no conjunction P and Q. It's like dividing by zero. This is the core rule of, of, of this. And now we look at what this means. Now we have a projector P that is uh, um, that we can see as a, a tensor product or the other product of A and B. Now let me, I see, you see this sign several times. Now I'm a bit ashamed that I didn't show to you what that really is. So it's here you see in a very simple form from Wikipedia what the Yardic product is. So if I have two vectors and create a Yardic product, I just get this times this and this times this. So that I get basically, if this is n long and n long, then I get n times n, get the table out of it. And if I take two tables and multiply them this way, then I get very, very big tables with all the combinations of the different colors. So it's, it's just, so to speak, creating out of these two vectors a complete vector space. That's what this Yardic product is doing. And it's also, it is, it is, it is, it is quite demanding uh, algebraically. Um, we will not get into all the details. It is also used, by the way, in general theory of relativity, or also, also as a tensor product. So, so this is a common mathematical tool that is needed both in quantum mechanics and general theory of relativity. Now, this, this theodic product, which, so here the projector piece decomposed into its theodic product. Um, so basically it says the projector matrix is just the matrix that I obtain by multiple, by doing this Yadik tensor product of the two other matrices. And so it's, it just is a big thing of both. And um, P is the conjunction of the separate properties of subsystems A and B. So, so, so A and B are small Hilbert subspaces. And if I make their Yadik product, I obtain P. Now, for example, I have here um, a state definition. Um, so I have um, I have now the projector Z A plus the other product X B minus, and um, which is defined, which means that the particle, the state of the particle A in the Z direction is spin plus one half, and of particle B in the X direction is spin minus Z. one half. And um, so this is a um, this is um, the um, this is a commuting interpretive projector which assigns spins to the particles A and B. This is not an entanglement, yeah, but it is, as you see here, I have one projector that describes in my Hilbert space a certain state of the particle A being in set spin positive, and of particle B being in X spin negative. Now by multiplying them, I obtain much bigger. Hilbert subspace, which is which is this Hilbert subspace, sorry, A cross B uh, or P, and in which I can now have commute, can now commute, so this times this is the same as this times this, and I can now describe perfectly the two particles separately, so this is just the spin in the Z direction, so stern gerlach apparatus like this, and the other one in the X direction, so stern gerlach apparatus turned around. Now the single entanglement, which we which we saw before in Morgan's notation, and which is very what gives rise to the horrible Bell inequality, inequalities and all of this, is looks like this. It's, it doesn't have a, um, such an operator, such a tensor product operator, but it just puts the tensor product operator in the state in the definition itself. So now I have I have to cre create the cross product of of two cats. Well, here I have the pro cross product of two operators. Mathematically, that's totally different. This commutes mathematically because these here are nothing but uh, cat bra times cat bra. These are just cats. And so if I write this down, I have something completely different. And, and this projects um, onto, so this here is, so instead of having these two um, projectors which are of which I have a tensor for it, I take here, this here, this cat can be projected into this subspace of Hilbert space, Psi. So this means a subspace. However, because I have the um, tensor products now inside the expression, these two don't commute anymore. Yeah? So, th so this, this projector, he doesn't commute with anything, only with 0 and 1. However, A and B, which I have here, they commute. 
So it, I can change them, but I can't. I can only interchange this com this projector with zero and one on A and B. So psi cannot say anything about the spin of A or B. So basically, psi is S A. So this is this means W means spin in any direction. So this expression is in the in the in the framework of consistent quantum um, theory. This expression is meaningless. It is like dividing by zero. And, and so what does this mean? It means that basically when I set up such state descriptions, I have to be very careful how I set them up and what I get and, and how I can avoid such expressions that create the paradoxa. The, the, all the quantum paradoxa can be reduced to expressions in which I have non-communing projectors. That, that's a mathematical idea. And this is, this is extremely brilliant. And we will now see how this is made sure by creating the consistent history that this doesn't happen. And, and um, it is a way to, so, so when you do the shut up and calculate approach with the Born rule and the von Neumann project, so you, you add up as a paradoxa, but you still get the right measurement. When you do this, the problems are made visible at the very beginning. So, so just hang on. Um, we can already at the very beginning identify which operators are non-commutative. Uh, Correct. And so why don't we just delete them all? Because we can create such states. We can create an entangled I state. See. I yeah. see. And so how, how we deal with this, we will see. Wait, right. you said we can or we can't? We can. Oh, okay, good. We can good, take good. a photon spin one yes, and using this, this, this technique to make a, out of it two pseudo yeah. photons with spin one half. Opposite. Now, um, now let's start to look at measurement because the measurement and preparation problems are we will not do the preparation problem. The preparation problem is what happens when we prepare the photon. It's too difficult. We can't do it here, but we can do the measurement. But, but suffice it to say that when we do preparation, we are putting knowledge into the prepared, prepared particles so that we are not pre predicting the future very, but we are just taking out what we put in when we prepare the particles. But now with the measurement. So the measurement is very important in quantum mechanics, as we have seen in our discussion of the experimentation of quantum mechanics. The problem can be subdivided into two aspects. The first, so this is now you see already the approach. So the, yeah, the measurement problem is first, how can the macroscopic outcome of the measurement, traditionally thought as a pointer position, be described in quantum terms? So pointer position is, for example, when you do the stern gerlach experiment, um, and, and you have one pointer, which is the uh, um, silver atoms on the top point and the other the bottom point. These are pointer positions. How can they be described in quantum terms and how is this outcome related to the earlier microscopic property the apparatus was designed to make? So this is a basically this is a measurement problem that, that, had, that John von Neumann has solved for and code by defining his um, the, the breakdown of the wave function. Now what they do, they subdivide this into two questions and that you can already see how the unity is given up. So they say, we have a Hilbert space S of the particle which is measured, and we have a Hilbert space M um, of the measurement apparatus. And the measuring device, so now we say, this is the autonomous state, state, this is a Japanese. So, so these, these S, SJ, are the cats that together make up the space in which the particle can move. So at first, so, so it can as, as, as and so the j's are the number of, so in our, we had the, ex, the example with the uh, 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 um, hydrogen uh, um, atom, which has only two states, and then we had the hydrogen molecule, which has eight states, right? And so these are the, these number of states. Then we have the measuring device state, which is which is a cat describing the vector describing the measuring and then we have a total system state now you see the total system state is now at time t0 is now just s0 tensor product with m0 and so now you see now we get so if these are two dimensions and these are eight dimensions we get 16 dimensional um, uh, 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 system state and now we need also a time development operator to see what happens when we move from the, when you move on in time. So this is our base, our system base state, measurement and, 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 and particle. 
and this is a time operator, which um, which looks like this. So it's an it's an exponential function. We've seen something like this already before, and it's just. You see here, it's taking the two time points in, which are here written as T1 and T2, and applies this to this dialectronic. And um, this gives out um, uh, uh, the J, um, and the, 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 so this makes, now we get the, the SJ, um, uh, tender product with, the, um, with MJ, which is the measurement out of the right and uh, the, the W notation, I have, we don't need it now. It's only for the preparation case, but the preparation case, as I said, is mathematically so involved that we cannot fit it into this course, but it doesn't matter. You get the idea also with the measurement thing alone. Now, um, at T1, we have the following. So T1 is just that we have applied the time operation to T0, but if at T1 nothing has happened, then T1, before, if nothing happens before T1, then applying, uh, op, uh, applying the time operator to Psi 0 just gives Psi 0 because, as Feynman puts it, the particle was just sitting there. Yeah. So nothing was happening. Now, now we, op, uh, we apply the time operator again, and there will be a measurement at time point T2. And you can see it already that the transition from T1 to T2 by multiplying the cat with the time operator gives now such a sum but with the cross product of the particle um, uh, um, particle um, cat with the um, uh, measurement cat. And so, so now, what, what do we get? So we basically get um, a time development history, that's why it's called consistent histories. And, um, and here, um, uh, uh, Griffiths has introduced a new sign so this sign, look at, we had the, the tensor product, it looks like this, and he now uses a tensor product where the x, that maybe some of you, as you have used at school, when you learn to do multiplication, row 3, x, 4 equals 12. That you learned a point b equals a b, and then you drop the point. Yeah? Here it's the point of multiplication placing the, the cross of the tensor, why does, why does he do this? Because he wants, it's still the same mathematical operation. He wants to say that here is a different time point. So basically, now the, the time dependent space that you obtain, when you, when you now look at the entire system, is the following. We have C0, which is the state of the system at the beginning, right? This is the ray um, of this cat. Um, then you have as the next point, time point, we have the ray of psi 1 and also its complement. So this is now the, the whole Hilbert space. This is a psi 1 ray and these are all the other kinds of the Hilbert space. Then you have the next time point, we have psi 2 and its complement and because we are not interested in the complement, we can say that for our purpose it's just psi 1, it's a, it's a ray of point 1, psi, sorry, point 0, Time point one, time point two, the ray. And here you can see once again how such ray looks like. So ray two is, like, ray one is just like ray zero, but ray two is a cross product, as a, as a tensor product of um, CJ of the, that's a complex number, com combination of the base states times the measurement prisma. So this family is of no use for resolving the first measurement problem M1 because the family of histories does not include the projectors M I for the pointers, pointer position at time t2, needed to discuss the measurement outcome. So why is this so? Wait a minute, so mj, it's hard to read because oh, I need to go into projection mode, otherwise I cannot read the superscript. This is because I have not been plotted. So, um, so here you see, here I have, this is a projector, right? But here again, I don't have a projector, I just have a cat. And we have seen the big difference between cat and projector already here. Yeah, here I was building a tensor product using two projectors, but here I have just cats in the tensor product. This is a mathematical big difference, and so here you see this difference again. Uh, when I when I use here um, here I have only the the, 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 the the cat and not the tensor. The tensor would be this. Uh, sorry, the, the projector is it's a yardic product of. The, the cat with the bra. 
And only because I don't have this here inside too, I cannot measure. So this family is useless for measurement. It, can, it cannot be refined to include them because Psi 2 will not commute with some of the MJ. So I could now say I want to decompose Psi 2 to actually show that it's made up of the dyadic of these, but it's, that is not possible mathematically because, because I just, I, I cannot add uh, the bra here without paying a price, so then it's not the same history anymore. But basically, this history is useless. But it, it, I'm showing it to show, um, so, so what, is, what do I start my reasoning with when I want to deal with the measurement problem? Now, I, what is the useful history? So how can the microscopic outcome of the measurement traditionally be thought of as a point of position be described in quantum time? Now I can define a new family. That's the freedom we're talking about. So this is a basic family. It's useless, we've seen. Now we define a new family. Now we have C0. Then time passes, we have C1, the state of the system after, after unit one plus time has passed. And now we have, as a third time point, we have now the measurement result. And you see what is done here is it's just because that, that is in the end, these are sets. Here these brackets are put around the operator to show that it's, uh, it, is, uh, it is also set. And why is this described in set? Because, uh, because the entire, I've not shown any of this because it's very advanced mathematics, but, but because I've shown that because, um, I've not shown that because the, um, because the set, the, the, the measurement theory that is required to understand the set theoretical foundations of this are too, too complicated. It would take a day alone to explain this, so I've left it out. Can you explain what the multiplication means? Yeah, I said it, I just tried to explain. It's the same multiplication than this one. So just taking two, yeah. making a bigger space out of it, which contains yeah. all the combinations of the space. It's called the tensor folder. But the only reason why he's writing it with this dot instead of the cross, it mathematically does the same as the cross, as the tensor folder. It just wants to indicate that here I have a time evolution. It's just to remind us. So, so you see this here really in, in a second from here really well. So if I if I plug this psi two into this, then I have here the dot product which which distinguishes the passing of time. I mean, so dot product, the, 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 sorry, the tensor product mark with the dot, and here the tensor is a cross to show that here now the states of the system and the measurement system uh, uh, are integrated. So I always try to think of the tensor product as a kind of cross product with additional constraints. Right? I take two sets, yes. and then I make a cross product. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Then you have a yes. Yes. So, and so, so this seems to be that you have additional rules now, when, so basically it's a rule for two. Yes. Right? So, you, so, but now this, so I don't understand the, con so you, you have additional constraints, and then you're allowed to make two sets. No, I have, I, once I have written down something that I want to, for, about which I want to calculate the tensor product, I have to do the tensor product as on the as it's described in every linear algebra textbook. Mm -hmm. The constraints do not apply to the operation of the tensor product in the standard fashion as it's as it's, as it's used in linear algebra. Uh, mm -hmm. The LR2, I think it was. Did you study in Germany? Yes, you did. Huh? You, you should know where you studied, but, but if you studied in Germany... Well, I, the communist <laughs> Ah, yeah, but then you have linear algebra 2. Right. But and, then, there, and this is just tensor product introduced in linear algebra 2. The mathematics you education... In Kronen, so what? You are allowed to do that in Kronen. Yeah, but, but still, the, I, all the mathematics... That's why you're so good. Now I realize it. No, really, the, the mathematical education in Eastern Germany was very good. I, all my friends, I have several friends who have studied mathematics or physics there, and they were, I mean, disregarding all the rest. Uh, they, the, the, I think they had a good education, was my impression, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> so, so anyhow. Um, but still, I don't understand what... So the constraints are put... Your question, I want to answer your question. So the constraints are actually coming not how this tensor is defined, but the constraints are when I can use it and where I can use it. So here, for example, I have to use the tensor folder on two, um, on two projectors, and if I use it on two cats, then I get an entanglement state. But if I use it on the projectors, I don't get an entanglement. 
Because this seems to be the difference, right? Yes. The standard view is that you can, whenever you're put into action, you basically get a sense of that, right? So you're and here in consistent histories, I may only use it safely when I get, so after that, when after I've used it, I get again commuting projectors. And if I don't do this, so I can switch them around and it gives the same result. Here I can't do this anymore. That's, that's the point. So, so basically, so, sorry, these can still be switched around, of course. But this here, this one here commutes only with the zero and the one projector. The zero projector annihilates everything and the one projector just gives the same, just gives the same vector again. And this year, these commute really among each other. So when I write down C as now as a projector, and then I want to say C times something equals something times C, the only solutions for this are zero or one. Whereas here, I, I, uh, if I, if I, the solution is of just the inversion, like it's, like it's written here. And so this, this is really the basic thing that you cannot, you said you put it in a very good way, that you're not allowed anymore to arbitrarily put everything in the tensor product, but, you, but, but only you can put things in the tensor product so that you um, still have the commutation. And ultimately, that means that the enzyme is restricted to commuting projectors, and that guarantees consistency. That's a fundamental trick. Okay, now. Um, um, so what does it mean to say that M J commutes with psi one. Uh, on what slide? So here, so you say you can only use commuting projectors. So presumably, M J times psi one has to be yes, so, equal so to now, psi one. Yes. So I can now write. I can now write. Um, I could now write this in in any order. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in what sense then is time still playing a role here? Um, well, of course the. Uh, the, the, the good thing is that the Schrödinger equation is time reversible, ah. and so the, so basically this just expresses like 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 I mean this is highly idealized physics, right? You can see it even from this yeah. one sentence I just said, but but therefore I can just make them commute okay. even at the time level. Yeah. So and you know from our work on our book that time reversibility in, in complex systems there is no time reversibility. Yeah. So now. We have we have now found a notation, a new family that is that, which is consistent. The operators commute and yields a probability according to the Born rule for the final position M J. Now, to answer this, so we have now found one history that helps us to understand the measurement that we do. Now we want another history for the second question, which is how is the outcome related to the earlier microscopic property of the apparatus the apparatus was designed to measure. Now, family F1, we have defined here, can't answer this question because the property of interest, Sj, are not included at T1. And so that's because, because at T1, there is no Sj because T1 is just, is, is when I apply T1, the T, sorry, the T operator to get from Psi 0 to T to time point 0, system state to the system state at time point one, I just get this out again. So therefore, I need to, to actually have my, have a family that takes into account um, uh, the, the particles and um, the microscopic property, I need to put the SJ um, operator in here, like I put the MK operator in here before, and now I get a, so what is called a joint probability distribution um, and um, and I don't I cannot tell you the rules why these equations are true. It's again too complicated. But you basically hear that that I, the probability of this and this is according to the rules of of stochastic inference. It's a product of the Born rule applied to the states times the um, times the um, uh, Kronecker matrix um, uh, of J K. So basically, that means that only um, the the, um, uh, the states which are the diagonal will be will be will be will, will, will count, uh, and that the other ones uh, and the other ones. So I here have to add them, right? And 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 uh, so um, the j's I have. So these are zero, one, and two. I have to add them, and then I have three expressions in the middle, and then I have to take the square of the absolute, and. When I multiply this with a Kronecker, um, 
I will get rid of quite of, of some of them again, which 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 are outside the diary. And here the probability um, uh, 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 that's the probability. Um, Yeah, so but it seems that this, unless I have made a mistake, it's, it can be just referring to this. But gi anyhow, given the measurement outcome at, at time point two, one can be certain that the prior state of the particle at time point one was SK. So the apparatus did what it was designed to do. So, so the point is now, with this history, I can say, um, with this history, I can say that whatever I measure at T2, that particle had to have the measured property at this point in time. This is the, the sense of the second history. And now also, measurement is a process in one system. Um, the first has the answers to the question, how can the microscopic outcome to the, of the measurement traditionally thought as the point of vision be described in quantum terms? I use this history, and for the second question, how is this outcome related to the earlier microscopic property that the apparatus was designed to measure, I can use this equation. And they are mutually incompatible system evolution models, because here, here I, have not, I know nothing about the state of the particle, here I know everything about it. And so I have now mutually incompatible system evolution models. These two solutions are mutually incompatible process models, which are used, however, to answer one question split into two aspects before. So the splitting of the two aspects is, of course, done in preparation for the equation to fit to the situation Barry S. Nancy Cartwright would put it. Yeah, so, so Nancy Cartwright says the physicist prepares the situation verbally already so that later on he can apply the desired equations. That's happening here. This is allowed by the first principle of consistent history is a consequence of the non-unitary system due to the breakup of the unitary world of common sense is characteristic for quantum mechanics and no interpretation can go overcome it. So this is what Feynman means when he says, if you say you have understood quantum mechanics, you haven't all understood it. So Feynman also was, he, he has not this, because he didn't spend so much time on these bloody Hilbert spaces, it's very funny how he hates mathematics. All the time he says it, it's so, it's so, so funny. So just a second. So this, this just means that even with the, with the ominous interpretation, the, the ambiguity of quantum mechanics doesn't go away. Um, I still have, so, so usually um, you do commut commutativity, uh, so, so algebraic expression of stuff which can occur simultaneously. Right? Simultaneous things in the world correspond to commutative operations or commutative operators. But, but here you seem to use commutative operators to be time evolution. Yes, also but for time. But the opposite of being simultaneous. Ah, so, 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 the, so I, I see your point. So commutativity can, can um, co commutativity as an as a expression of simultaneousness is, all, is true for time irreversible systems. So in time irreversible systems, you use commutativity indeed for simultaneous. Mm -hmm. But this is a time reversible system. That's, that, I mean, you can see very strongly so the Schrödinger equation, it's a wave, right? And so you can go back to the wave and see what was before. It's just, it's just, you can just, uh, and, and so th this you can see very clearly from here. So I didn't invent this, but, but, but as Barry is asked, what does commutativity mean here? Yeah. So, so how, how can, I, if this means the passage of time, how can I put this before this? That's terrible. Yeah, that's because of the time, re time reversibility. It doesn't mean that the time evolves suddenly in a different way. It just means that, that, that I, because of the time reversibility, I am allowed to use commutativity in the sense that seems strange to you. Yeah. But, but it, is, it, is, it is yet just another mathematical construct that, that, that basically helps us to, pre this, this, with this we can get rid of axiom five, of the of terrible axiom five by John von Neumann. And we can, the price is now we have two different worldviews that we use at, for two different aspects of the problem. So what the consistent history approach does, it makes, it, it makes the, 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 the um, ambiguity or the, the anti-common sense character of quantum mechanics explicit at a step that ensures total consistency later on. 
So very early on when you set up the model that you want to use, you make this all explicit and you see immediately that these are inconsistent, but, but, but it doesn't matter because you say, I'm allowed to do this and as long as, as, I, as I get mathematically sound. And it, it yields the same mathematical results as, as the other theory. Now this is, this is, this is basically the basic idea. I, I, I have only shown you a very small subset of the full mathematics, but I think the idea is nobody has, was able to say that this is mathematically not sound. If you look at the full description of how the linear algebra is described, and also they have, they, they also do this, so all as I'm showing here as toy models with finite spaces, like the one I showed yesterday, like the ammonia maser and so on. You can also do this, all of this for the infinite space, when you're using full function analysis. It becomes very mathematically demanding, and the second half of the, of the book, which I have not finished yet fully, is, 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 is very complicated and does this for infinite space. And it also saw, shows how you can come from the infinite Hilbert space, how it aggregates again to classical mechanics. So, yes? So, I, as you know, I've read some of the, yeah. the consistent histories uh, literature, and I'm a big fan of consistent histories, but I understand much less of the mathematics than you do. And so, let me tell you how I understand the broad approach, and then you can tell me where I'm going wrong. So, first of all, when we toss a coin, um, several times, let's say we toss two coins, uh, and the first time we get two tails, the second time we get two heads, and so on. We can make a list of all the possible uh, states of the two, to two, cost, uh, two toss process, and they will form a space of which consists of consistent pieces of history. All right? TT, TH, HT, and HH are the four possible consistent histories for the two, yeah, yeah. two coin tossing. Now, my, I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing now a view which is, even on my part, much more complicated, but uh, to save time, I will give you the, the big bang. The difference between classical physics and quantum physics is that in classical physics, you can only have one consistent history obtaining at any one time. But in quantum physics, all of the consistent history obtain at each time, it's just that each has a, a smaller than one probability. Now, is there any sense to what I just said? I mean, basically, the difference is 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 that um, the difference is that one process is now split up into two histories, which are different, which 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 use different variables to describe different aspects. And that, that just, so this, this is what this shows, right? So, so you say one process is divided into two histories. Yeah, I mean, two histories are used to model one process. And, and I, the two histories it, are shown here. And they are mutually be, inconsistent. And could it be said that they have different probabilities? Does that mean? Uh, oh, okay, so what, with regard to the probability that you can calculate out of this, um, you can now. I, sh I, I show this on the Schrodinger cat example, I think, how you can calculate the probabilities. But basically, you can calculate the probability here to obtain a certain measurement, and here to, to, to you can calculate the probability if you don't have the measurement, what was the state of the particle. Okay, so then let's take it a little bit further. Supposing you have two scientists, F1 and F2, and F1 likes the first model, and F2 likes the second model, and so F1 sets up the equipment so that the first model comes out to yield the correct measurement. And F2 sets up the equipment so that the second model... Oh no, so that's not possible. So, so they are mutually incompatible, but they are also together only complete. So you can't, if you have only one, you don't have a model to answer the measurement. Problem. Okay, but th then let, let's suppose, it, it, I don't want to talk about possible worlds. No, but that's, that's uh, the alternative. Yeah. I mean, the problem is these are not two possible worlds. Yeah. These are two possible Three models. models. Yeah. yeah, that's and what and, and you need Omnes the, says. Yeah, and you need, to, you need to have both of them to answer this question. And to do that, to show how this comes about, you first split the question into two questions, and then you yeah. have a model for each sub-question, and then by, by taking them together again, you get the full answer. Yeah. However, what you have done is nothing but... but push the ambiguity that you have at the end in the breakdown of the wave function conundrum 
up to, to having two different histories. So you couldn't get rid of the problem that, that you have a break up of the, unit, of the common sense world. But the thing should correspond to the way so, so lots of people look at this um, quantum mechanics or quantum theory from information theoretic point mm -hmm. of view. Mm -hmm. So there you just say that there are constraints to information that is possible. Mm -hmm. So that's what you are saying here, right? Mm -hmm. So it's impossible to have so it's to understand information as the more information you have, the more possibilities you can exclude. Right? So that's that's the way understand the formation. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, and so, so you seem to say here that uh, well, there's a friction on information which kind of lets you decide between those two. Right? So there's no way to exclude one. So that's why you can tell the story of the different Yes, yes, yes. Right? So, but the different would be uh, well, surely consistent with this information yeah, yeah. So, so there is also, I think, a chapter in, in Griffith's book uh, where he, or is it, uh, in one of his papers, no, I think, we, I know where it is, in one of his papers, or even in the book chapter, no, I, I know, I know, it's here, there is one section of his article describes the relationship of consistent history to information theory, but with regard to quantum information for quantum computing. Uh -huh. And there he, he says similar things than you say. Yeah, so it, it, what you say makes total sense, and it's, it, it's indeed, uh, it is indeed um, uh, naheliegend, uh, how you say this? Um, uh, tempting. Yeah, tempting, I think it's not such a good choice, but it's indeed tempting to, to, to make this comparison. But, but basically, so this is the result, and now I want to show you the Schrödinger cat. So Schrödinger, Schrödinger okay. was, was, was uh, um, concerned with how to interpret su the superposition, right? So when you have uh, an alpha, here's a uranium source, and a detector of alpha particles. And Schrodinger's cat is a, Schrodinger published this paper um, as a thought experiment in which he, he states that in a QM model of alpha decay detection of the detector, there is a state of opposition. Sorry, there's this title here. I wrote this. Actually, I wrote this this morning. Because Barry asked me to, but therefore it's not yet fully finished. Um, the state of opposition with two states of status particle detected and non-detected. And as long as, and, um, and um, Schrodinger imagines that the detector is linked to the device to kill the cat upon particle detection. Now, but if the particle is in superposition before it's been detected, is the cat then alive or not? So basically, he imagines that then a hammer would be released and destroy a flask with ga poison gas and then the cat would die. Now, of course, Schrodinger knows that you cannot link macroscopic states to quantum states like this. He also writes it in the paper. He just gives the example because um, I think he made the mistake of trying to be humorous as a German, which I carefully avoid. <laughs> Successfully, too. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and you should, as a German, you should not try to make any jokes. So it's, it's really bad. And, and, uh, and so, but, but, but basically, it's still the question is, what is the status of the cat in superposition states that and the life of the cat? This is, and, and he just wants to make clear uh, with his classical example. And now, what does quantum history do with that? So again, the situation can be modeled using the consistent history. Here's a, is a consistent history uh, with C1 and C2 projectors onto the states C1 and C2, which are dead and alive, and the family should be interpreted as a set of four mutually exclusive histories obtained by choosing a T1 one of the projectors inside the first pair of curly braces in a T2, one inside the second pair. Psi 2 is the superposition of dead and alive cat states. Okay, that's the superposition. Um, if a series, it, now he says, it is a serious misunderstanding to suppose that Psi 2 or the corresponding property Psi 2 represent a cat which is both dead and alive. First, the projectors P and D, PD and PA, that correspond to the cat being dead or being alive, do not commute with Psi 2, so they cannot, by the single framework rule, be, so, be brought into the discussion. So they make no sense. So they, because they commute, they make no sense. Second, because their product is zero, because they, they are linearly independent, so their product must be zero, both properties cannot be true simultaneously, so it's false to say that the cat is both dead and alive. 
So that's, the, again, the commutation argument. And then there's another argument also. Um, one can set up an alternative history which looks like our measurement history that, uh, that we just had. And now we can say we have quasi-classical projectors PD and PA at time T2 and Psi T is now understood not as a property. That's very interesting. So here I don't have, so Psi 2 is not anymore Psi 2, but just the measurement. And now in the advanced stuff that I haven't shown you, Psi 2 is now a pre-probability that is going into the assignment of this probability that the cat stands in our life. And, and then the paradox has disappeared. So it's again the same trick. Um, a history is chosen with, with where the projectors commute, and then I don't have the paradox on them. And, and so this is, with all, he goes through many of the, there are much more complicated paradox now that there's a Wiener paradox on, for example, no, uh, Winger, no, what's his name? Uh, we, we will encounter him again later when we do particles. There, there, are, there are more and more, more complicated paradox signs. All of them are resolved in this way, or dealt with in this way. So, um, so, so to summarize this, and I, will, oh, I, I also will show you what we will go through, I hope we can manage this, which is more difficult is the locality, yeah, we get strong. So, so what are the merits of consistent history beyond the measurement problem? It avoids axiom five, the correlate of the wave function. Yeah, typo. It provides a series of weak measurements. Um, it can deal with intricate problems of quantum information, which it sees as comparison of incompatible frameworks. So this is, this is what you should look at if you're interested. So you can go to this article, um, Tom, and read the passage about quantum information. And then you, there is a lot of literature cited. It's very, it, it, it is at the moment in quantum theory, the most uh, field with the most activity. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. And, and, and I'm certain, you know, it, 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 I know you not too well, but if you take the time to go into it, you can certainly write a good paper by finding out a nice uh, thing that is not well resolved. So it's, it's, it's a really a very good field. I also thought of doing it, but I am not too busy with other stuff, but it's, it is a, you can smell the rot that is in the field and you can clean something up. Um, then um, uh, uh, it, it resolved paradoxa like the Schrodinger's cat as well as interference incompatibility and contrafactual paradoxa, which are others. It rejects holism by pointing out that singlets and triplet sets are prepared. Yeah, so it has a preparation theory. So it says, no, there is no holism because I put in information, uh, which you pointed out, when I do the preparation and when I get the measurement of the entangled states, I have not, to, there is no holism because I know, I, of, of course I can have two physicists, one who does the preparation and now make the, make the triplet state with both spin up, but he doesn't tell the other physicist if one spin is up and down or both are up. And then you can say the second physicist needs to do two measurements and can say, oh, hooray, uh, I have holism. But actually that's cheating because information was, was withheld. And, and in physics, no information is to be withheld, right? So this is, this is, this is just the holism. So this is very, the, the arguments against, against holism are very strong and holism is terrible, I think, because otherwise you, all the, your theory of, of partitions won't work anymore. Uh, so it's, it's very good that, that they can reject holism. And it shows that quantum mechanics conserves the locality of physics, which is for me a big relief. So I, like you, a couple of weeks ago, I was carrying the burden of having to believe in the non-locality. I really, it, 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 and it really puzzled me, really, you know, because because I'm like I thought Einstein must have been right and so on, and and I didn't see this without the help of these guys, and and uh, so it was a big relief for me <laughs> that, that when I learned this. So, so this is now the most difficult part of the entire talk, and and I wonder. So Barry, this are let me go through one, two, three, four. Four very, very dense slides. But I, I think we have still time. Should I do that, Barry? I'm just going to look at the uh, schedule. It goes until 12, so we got another half hour. Uh, so is the lunch one hour or half hour? So we, we can discuss that. But uh, you are, hang on. I will do another session tomorrow yeah. afternoon. So the lunch break is is scheduled at 12.30. Okay, so I have the time. It's yeah. yeah. Maybe we can... Oh, that's Saturday. Yeah, yeah, on that yeah but maybe it doesn't matter very... Uh, let me just do the slides and read it. We'll Actually, today back. the lunch is scheduled at 12, so try and be quick. Okay. Good. So, um, 
I mean... Actually, no, d d d say 12.30 because you won't be here after lunch, right? Yeah, yes, but so I, I think I, it, will, I do, it will take me till 12 or 12.15 something. Yeah. So let's look. So we have, we have um, uh, an entangled single state, singlet state, and um, uh, which is here. It's funny if you look at Morden. Morden has, is a philosopher, so he has written it like this. 1 divided by square root of 2 minus 1 divided by square root of 2. He forgot to... Um, he didn't see that he could just factor out <laughs> the square root of two. That's nice. <laughs> so, so it's so funny. And, and basically it's interesting because, well, let's not go there. But anyhow, so, um, so this has no notion. So this singlet state just says that I have a state in which I have uh, particle A in D plus and particle B in D minus spin and vice versa at the same time and the superposition. Um, and it, this has no notion, I've prepared these, I know these, so there is no non-locality. They are together, I know about them, period. What happens over time? Now I have a time operator again, which is written, so which is, um, which is a time operator which, act, which, which I model to perform an operation on particle A and particle B, and I again have tensor products. Now I um, have a, fa a family of histories based on three times, T0, T1, and T2, and I have, to, for your convenience, I have here made bra brackets so that you can more easily see where the new time point is. So this, I have made a bracket here because it's a short, very short time point, time point T0, <laughs> and then I have the time point T1 and the time point T2. And in time point T1, I have Z is positive, spin, um, I have the possibility ZA positive, Z A negative, Z B positive, Z B negative, uh, and here I have the same. And because of the entanglement, only two of the sixteen possible histories have non-zero probabilities. So these are the so because the, all the others because of the entanglement, many many of the theoretical. So now I have a big matrix where I can define different total probabilities, but only these. But most of them are zero because because when I have Z positive, the other one is always negative, and so therefore most cancel out. So, and now um, if, if, if you go through the probabilities, and here are the two ones that this one is particle one. So, wait a minute, this is the particle, this is the point in time, this is the spin, and this is spin direction. Particle A at time point one has Z positive spin. Particle B at time point one has Z negative spin. And this is particle A at time point two with positive spin, and particle B at time point two with negative spin. And here is the opposite. And these are the only ones that are um, that are, exist, and they have the, the probability each of one half. And together, they have probability one of half. Yeah. Now, um, these are the complementary singlet drive spin states as z for both particles. Either the particle has this, or either it has this. Now, we have here another family. Um, which has also uh, uh, three time points. Time point one, time point, uh, time point zero, time point one, time point two, with SZ for particle A, but SW for particle B, where SW is an arbitrary but specific direction for its particle B. So that means that now I don't know any, I'm, I, I, I measure as, as um, that is what, um, Bell pointed out, I don't have to measure in the entangled state necessarily the spin in the same direction. I can also measure it on the ball where I can measure all directions in any direction. Yeah. So I don't have only x, y, and z, but I can do any combination of them. And, um, and now um, I have here, so the probabilities now, a bit, I don't, I'm not shown how to compute them, just, th but they are right. So now I have, can have Particle A at time point one Z positive, particle B at time point one W negative, and then this one is still positive and this one still negative, or I can have Z at A one negative, Z at A two negative, and the other one positive, or I can have um, uh, A at uh, a, particle A at time point one, Z positive, B at time point one positive. So that's the inverse of this. Here this is changed, and here this is changed. Yeah, so these are the two complementary 
the true complementary uh, um, evolutions that I can have over time for the pair of particles. These are the complementary signature of spins that I see for both particles. Note that whatever value S B W has at time T1, it has exactly the same, same time, the same value at time T2, just as one would have expected for a particle in the absence of any interaction with the rest of the world. So look at this. So this is S, this is B, B W, time point one, B W time point two, B B W time point one and two, time point one and two, and so on. So it, it, it stays as it is. Um, now this is the condition, so this is now another family. Now, let's look what happens when we measure. So we can, we can, we can now um, have new time operators that model the measurement. And now we have a, a Hilbert space, um, which is a tensor product of three Hilbert spaces. So we have the A Hilbert space, the B Hilbert space for particle B, and the measurement Hilbert space. And we saw this pattern already here, where we also have here, we are multiplying in also measurement just now. So, um, um, yeah. And now these time operators, um, let's look at what they do. So we have now the R particle with positive Z spin, and we are creating the tensor product with the measurement um, state zero. Now at time point T, one, Z A is positive and uh, M zero is, uh, um, is M zero. At time point T two, is it still the same? And then between two and three, I have a measurement. And now um, I have, I have uh, I re the measurement makes that I have here the complement of this particle, not any more the particle. And I have now here M plus, which is the positive measurement. I've measured the positive spin. And this means basically that I've destroyed the state of the particle by the measurement. Now it's not a quantum particle anymore, because I've measured it. It, 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 is, it, 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 it was, so to speak, it, it has lost its properties. And the same, if it's, if it's negative particle, I can do the same. And when, when I reach the measurement point, the measurement device becomes has stayed negative, and the particle is destroyed. Now, so that means that the measurement does not even, you know, what does the measurement do to the to, to this to this particle? It it just it just does what it's expected to do. It just takes on at the between time point two and three, the measurement apparatus takes on the time point, the, the, the value of the spin, and the particle gets destroyed. Now this was not an entanglement, this was just one particle. Now let's look at the at the family of and of uh, and, uh, and entangled family. So we have here again our starting point. Then we have time point one and time point two and time point three. I couldn't make, put a curly brace, therefore I just made this error. I hope you don't mind. And you see now, by the way, just as a side premise. So this is not from the book. This is from the paper ERP Bell and Quantum Angle Locality, which is really, really a very, very good paper. So, so. Um, because there is, there is a, I'm, I cannot bring across everything in there, but it is basically um, a very, very brilliant um, discussion of Bell and, and uh, high, highly intellectually enjoyable. Shouldn't it be EPR? Yeah, yeah, I, I can, I often commute <laughs> letters where I shouldn't. Einstein for Rolls yeah, you're right, it should be EPR. Um, so, um, now, now you see here the advantage of his notation because now we have nested time development with tensor space products, as, as tensor products. So we, we need, it's much easier to read if we see the time development here and then we know that this happens within the time. So here you see the entanglement, A is positive, B is positive. Um, so this is an entanglement, this is a family where there are, I oh know this is not an entanglement, this is just the tensor product that creates a space in which I can have the entanglement. And now I have the entanglements. Look at them. So at time point one, I have A positive in the Z direction and B, B negative in the Z direction. At time point two, I still have this. And at time point three, I have a measurement apparatus which becomes positive. 
my ZA particle, the A particle has been annihilated. Um, you see that here the annihilation is already shown because here I have a tensor product of any more of the particle, but of the measurement apparatus because we saw the previous slide that the particle is getting, is, is getting lost. So are you sure you mean annihilated? That would mean that something happened to it. Yeah, it happened. It was measured. So if a photon hit ah, the detector, okay. it's oh, gone. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Something very bad happened to it. It's yeah, destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and so, and so. Oh, the, the photon is not destroyed. The photon, the energy of the photon is transformed into a different a photon energy, into a different form of energy. Okay. So on the detector, right? the detector screen, you, you, get, you get a signal, and this signal means that, uh, that, 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 of course, the energy is conserved, but not the photon. But the energy so take in, in the line you were just pointing to, the A1, B1, A2, B2. Uh. And now let's suppose that we have re reversibility of time. And so we want to represent the fact that A1, B1 have reappeared. How could we do that? Um, so the measurement is, of course, not time reversible, right? Okay. So, 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 what, what, ah, that's, so the universe is not time reversible. Yeah, the measurement, I mean, the measurement is, the, 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 this is a problem. Maybe that, it's um, the Schrödinger equation is time reversible, but the measured Schrödinger yeah. equation is not time reversible. I see. So if, we, if there had never been any measurement, then time would be reversible. In the Schrödinger equation. Yeah. Okay, but not so in itself. Well, I mean, I mean, it, it depends really. If you have a situation like the Halley comet or some of these, you know, these these comets that appear only every hundred or two hundred years, they all they they are on a perfect world line, as Tom would say. So because we because because for example, if this is a solar system, I mean, I don't know which one it is now, but let me draw out here that the others can see as well. So this is a solar system, right? Here's the sun, and this is the, this is the outermost planet. I always forget which one it is. No, they, they change their minds now and again. No, no, they they, they demoted one of them to not a planet anymore, but they didn't. So and then this this comet has this trajectory. So so he has an, he, he, he is, this is the sun, and then here's another uh, point of the ellipse. Uh, sorry, of the uh, yeah of the elliptic orbit. It come, he comes back every hundred or it comes back every hundred years or so. So this trajectory is a world line according to Hamilton's equation. Although because it, or it's an almost perfect approximation of it. So there are in reality entities which behave and it's time reversible. So now I can go and now I'm here. It's now here and this is uh, 2022. Now I want to ask how was it in 1743? Then I can calculate it back, and then I have its position is 1740. Presumably, it's losing molecules. Yeah, yeah. On the so well, I yeah, in a billion years yeah. I mean, will. yeah. The, though the problem uh, takes quite. A, I mean, look, look at this. I mean, if it if it is one of those which have a schweif, uh, the tail. Okay. Thank you. If it's one of those which have a tail, then you're right. Then it will not survive very long. But if it's tailless, tailless. Um, uh, um, Asteroid. Asteroid. It, it will not. It will not. Uh, it will not disappear very soon because it's vacuum. So there's almost no friction, yeah. Yeah. and that's why Lord Newton's first law is so good, because there's no friction uh, in in the universe, right? In, 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 and therefore, uh, therefore, the momentum is conserved. Anyhow, so so there are real events, and and uh, which are like are like this. But I I want to I would like to finish this. So basically, now we have. Um, <coughs> we have the probability that um, that uh, we have either the probability that we get a, a negative measurement for the particle uh, A, in which case then B must be positive or vice versa. And both are of course an one off. And the marginal probability is, is actually probability that given the positive measurement of M3, A is also positive, and B, B, given the positive measurement of B, Z is negative. And they are of course both one. That sits from the measurement outcome m, pl m plus, which we have here at time t three. One can infer that particle A at earlier times, but later than t zero, had z z spin plus one half, while particle B had minus one half at times t one and t two. 
and continue to possess this value at time t3. That there is no non-local physical effect associated with it can be seen by noting that the approach also leaves the right answers for BZ at the earlier times T1 and T2 before the measurement of AZ occurs. We so that that there is no non-locality. We see here the, the that the, that all the measurements are right. Um, and we can calculate the probabilities for this by applying Born's rule to this framework, which all the steps I've skipped, but we can do this. So we get the right answers. We, we remark, and now that this is hard to understand without the context, but he remarks that at time t1, particle b can be in the backward light cone of the space-time region, um, with t somewhere between t2 and t3, which the measuring device interacts with particle a. So, so the, the particle b is in the, indeed in the cone of the, uh, the light cone, uh, speaking in the language of special theory of relativity, but therefore now backward and superluminal causation readily emerges from quantum theory when calculational methods are confused with physical causes. And so that is the key conclusion of, of where his British says that, that basically for Neumann axiom or, and the way that measurement is interpreted in, in and Feynman doesn't make this mistake. I, I want to highlight once more. And so there is no backward causation. No, there is no backward causation, and there is no superluminal causation. Either. Good. And and this and this this is shown by 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 this consistent history approach. And so, so this is how he debunks non-locality, but he replaces it again with with the necessity of having several different families to explain one process. So you so the price is non-unity. So now we can summarize. Consistent histories cannot avoid the non-unity of quantum reality that we measure. We measure a non-unity. What does that mean? Bloody hell, if we take here a photon, just think of a photon, we don't know whether it will come through. It's, super, it's superposed. When it's here, it's superposed, and we don't know its superposition. Only when, when we have known that we have started the photon here, nothing comes here, then we know it was, it was in the X, uh, X prime polarization. But while it was here, we did not know whether. So that is what we measure. Because there is nothing there to know. Um, no single thing. Yeah. There is a photon. Oh. No, but there's no single. Yeah, the superposition. Yeah. yeah, and so and so there are two conclusions. And this is, I think, the coronation of of uh, of, uh, of the so far what we've had in this entire course, this slide. So that and th this is also for me. It's not in any other textbook. So so it's a didactic trick, but it's still good. So so either you get non-locality and holism. That's what Morgan is doing from this insight, or you get non-unity. Many words, are, so there was a third alternative, which is hidden variables, which was the nicest one. Unfortunately, it was rejected. So that's the result of the Bell experiments. So Bell experiments only reject the invariants, but they don't reject uh, uh, locality. Or you get non-unity. The, the bad way of getting non-unity is, oh, the world is splitting up when I do a measurement. How could any reviewer accept this for publication? Or it's because it's such a nonsense. Because well, the reviewer was one of David Lewis's PhD students. Yeah, uh, probably. Or he had read Heidegger's before or whatever. Or drunk too much, I don't know. Yeah. But, but, but at, least in, <laughs> at least, or at least you have incompat in, incompatible models, which is what, what, what consistent history is. So consistent history is consistent because the explanations become consistent, but, but, it's, but it has incompatible models. So the mainstream concludes non-locality and holism from various quantum experiments. Griffiths, Omnis, and other consistent histories theoreticians use a better mathematical foundation of QM to replace non-locality. And it is with better mathematical foundation, I really mean it. It is such a, I've read, I, unfortunately now, Griffiths already is 86 or 87, he's living. I wrote him an email, he didn't answer, but I wrote him that I was also, he, he, he only uses utility. He says, the best one is the most, well, I think it's a, the most beautiful one is the best. So, so, yeah, so I wrote I, him that his was the most beautiful. Can I just uh, re request that you find a better phrase than incompatible models? So incompatible models sounds like you have two scientists who develop two different theories, and you mean something much narrower than that. Yeah, uh, where do I have Yeah, you had it on the screen that you were just showing us. Uh, incompatible system of models. No. They are really incompatible. No. The, okay, now the, the, keep, keep one of the the slides where it was for a minute. Put back the slide with the incompatible system model. There. So 
I, I, I don't know whether we've thought this through terminologically in our treatment of the ontology of models, but I, when you are building a model, it seems to me you're doing something quite general. When you're building a kind of ticker tape uh, tagging of what's going on in a given system, you're not building a model. These are, uh, these are two models of the system of evolution. And these are two models and so well, uh, but that's no, be, that, that's because you're, that these are models, I agree, but that's because they are types which can be instantiated in every relevant case in such a way that those relevant cases have alternative system evolutions as depicted by this type, uh, uh, model at yeah. the type level. Uh, but, but and so the, the, the crucial thing is that um, what is incompatible is not the models, it's the use of the models to create accounts of specific system evolutions. Uh, but that's really a bit harsh, but I mean, basically... Yeah, I, this is a hair I want to split. Yeah, but it can't be split. I mean, there is a price to pay for the approach. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I just want it to be expressed properly. Yeah, but, but I think I, I've expressed it fully. We can just handle the adjective because you've added, you've just reformulated what is written here. Okay, so then so let we, me. The, we can, these can just are change the adjective. okay. You, the colon here should be replaced by comma. For example, colon. I that makes that me better, but that's but but now you are again repeating. Sorry to be now a bit tough, but now you again you're just saying you're just stating this. So, so yes, I can have I have liberty and equality. So you are now restating the principles of of the consistency. Uh, I think you're correct. So so it was good you rederived them backwards, so to speak, which shows that you understood it very well. So that's a good, but it doesn't add. So but I still want to. But what, we, what you're pointing out is right. No, it adds uh, the, to the distance of our view from the many worlds view. Okay, so the many models I, I, I is not it, like the I many worlds. I get it, I need it completely. Yeah. And, and I, I, we need, but these are just slides, right? Yeah, yeah. But in the paper, anyway. yeah. I, I get the point. So, um, so, um, so I guess it, 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 it must be not ma many words, or alternatively, and then we need a better term. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, good. So now, now comes a big surprise, which I think, um, which I'm a bit proud of. So, um, so Omnis replaces um, uh, non-locality by non-unity. Is there an alternative? Yes, quantum incompleteness. So I believe in quantum incompleteness, but not like Einstein, but in the in the other way that I will explain. But now there were questions. I think. Sorry, I did. Didn't you have a question? Anyone else? No? Okay. So I have a, a different view, and I still have time to explain it, which is my view, what are the consequences of interfusing how many star forces. Maybe I have to do something, some of them tomorrow, but it doesn't matter, because that will, that will be a better way than starting a new section, just reminding you. So this is Kepler's laws illustrated. Sorry, that's a German thing. This is his first law, and then his second law, which you can so show here. It's just a nice picture of why did I take this because um, I want to show what happened in physics since antiquity. So in, in, the, in the antiquity, physics was a part of philosophy, much as ontology was a part of philosophy before Barry came. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so physics was a part of philosophy, it was non-experimental. Principles of rational explanation of the nature, or order of natural order of entities, causes of genesis, evolution and construction of the world. Thales, uh, 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 said that there are elements, fundamental matters and elements. Democritus found the atoms, Aristotle invented the term physics, the science of space, time, motion, and causality in his understanding. Physics did not use mathematics. The mathematics of the time were independent and used for direct engineering. So mostly the, the, the mathematics that they had were just used to build uh, pyramids, but the Greeks didn't py build pyramids, but they did a lot of stuff using elementary, uh, elementary mathematics, trigonometry and uh, arithmetic and elementary algebra. Then came the Renaissance and the experimental mathematical physics. So Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler invented the modern empirical and experimental science we call physics. Bacon was the first to describe the structure of physics in his new organ. The starting point of this type of scientific inquiry is our common sense understanding of the mesoscopic nature. So this mesoscopic nature is what we can see, feel, hear, and so on. 
it's basically the limit is a bit is the sun and the moon that you can see with your bare eye in a way and the smallest thing is uh, um, a micro a millimeter a half a millimeter and then it ends because we can't see it properly anymore. Um, so the starting point is this is so the, the scientific inquiry was was directed at telescopic nature. Modern physics is now characterized by the formalization of empirical field finding the mathematical equations, that was Lagrange, and the usage of the laws of mathematics to develop these further. So what you see all the time, what I also showed you is you set up an equation which is tied to your model, and then you plug in other equations to change it algebraically. You are then acting in the realm of mathematics. Uh, but, but this ultimately leads you to the right solution. That's what I mean with laws of mathematics and lock these further. This allows exact description and prediction of natural and technical processes. Now this is kind of the good Renaissance physics. And now let's review what Planck and Einstein did. So they started from classical physics when they discovered quantization. So like Luther started from Catholicism and developed Protestantism, it's quite comparable. They started, they were also, you know, Ca classical physicists, and then they discovered quantization. And Planck's, so, and Planck's discovery of quantization was coupled to experimental data from a classical system, the black body radiation. I mean, the experiment is not a blacksmith holding a piece of iron, obviously, it's a bit more complicated, <laughs> but it's, you get the principle. Like all modern physicists, he wanted to find an equation to model the data properly. The, this brought him, him to quantization, though he did not like the idea himself at first. So, Einstein's departure from classical physics in 1905 was also inspired by the failure to explain the important experiment, the Michael and Morley experiment. And unfortunately, we cannot do it in this course. We can't do it relatively. Einstein and the followers of Planck who developed quantum mechanics used the classical modeling approach of physics described earlier, but both needed to depart from the traditional idea of Linnean space. Einstein needed the four dimensional Minkowski space time, and 10 years later, the Einstein tensor. And quantum mechanics needed the Hilbert space, both highly abstract mathematical structures. Why did this happen in Germany? Because there were the mathematicians who had developed the right theory. I was in the, I had a lot of, I had to give lectures in the rooms where they were working. So they're not, 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 now they are very funny names, so one is called the Hilbert space. <laughs> 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 because Hilbert and so on. And, and uh, Hilbert Raum it's called. So. And in, in German, the pun is even better because room means yeah. Raum and Hilbert Raum means Hilbert space. <laughs> <laughs> and and so both behind and so and so the, therefore it was all done in Germany, and um, the, and and so um, that's a starting point. And what's interesting is that general theory of relativity um, forced physics into abstract mathematics, um, and quantum mechanics is really against common sense. And now the effect of the general theory of relativity on physics was less extreme than quantum mechanics. Why? Because general theory of relativity is just a generalization of Newton's mechanics, with a special, which then becomes a special case of it. But, but it preserves all the metaphysical theorems of classical physics, causation, unity, principle of least action, separability, de determinism. So this is why Eichen opposed quantum theory and thought it was incomplete. And he was right, in my opinion. The main change against classical physics in the, in the, is the usage of an abstract fundamental Riemann manifold that cannot be imagined using common sense anymore, but that is still tied to experiments and observations. Furthermore, leaving the mathematical abstraction aside, it is perfectly compatible with common sense. What's happening in, in, in I mean, uh, uh, the time evolves differently at the speed of light, needs a bit of getting used to, but it's not so hard. Quantum mechanics also force physicists to use the post Euclidean sp phase space, which is the infinite dimensional Hilbert space, which it's actually, in the way that they do it mathematically, cannot even exist because they want to maintain the Kronecker delta and they can't without the Dirac function. I can't show this to you, but it is, it is mathematically impossible. But like the general theory the, of relativity, the theory cannot be assessed by a common sense imagination. So you can't imagine a four-dimensional Riemannian manifold and you can't imagine an, an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. However, the results of quantum physics are against our common sense understanding of the world. Quantum mechanics seems to indicate that there are non-local effects, no world unity, no separability, no determinism. This is a massive contradiction with our primary knowledge, which enables our survival as a species. So, so we, are, we don't have much instinctive behavior, so we need the common sense to survive. Even the best interpretation of quantum mechanics, which we have consistent histories, cannot preserve the idea of the unity of nature, because it needs several histories to explain one phenomenon. So that's a more a way which is not a multiple world way to say it. Yeah. Um, so. That first of all, is the phenomenon that you're referring to natural? 
Yeah, so this is my argument. Uh, that's why I think the quantum mechanics is incomplete, because it's not an abstract model. We'll get to this in a minute. Uh, so, I mean, that and also, w would you question its indeterminacy, like it, it's uh, the fact that it's not de determinate as well? Or like no, we have, we have already So you, you are okay with that? No, we have already rejected the notion that, that, the, that the Schrodinger equation is not deterministic before. We have already said, when we looked at the six Maudlin, uh, yeah. that the determinism is not a problem because, because, uh, um, because we, have we, have, we, have a, we have a stochastic outcome that, has, that obeys a deterministic law. Yeah. So, so what are then the ontological consequences of, of quantum physics? So, so all interpretations of quantum physics are incompatible with common sense, also the omnis one. But physicists claim that the Schrödinger equation, the Dirac equation, and the models of quantum field theory are complete descriptions of the behavior of particles. However, quantum mechanics, which is Schrödinger, and quantum electrodynamics, which is Dirac and Feynman, can only model a few particles, so they cannot be complete, right? And models that can only model few particle systems can't be complete, obviously, because nature is not made of few particles only. We will see in the next section that furthermore, the main series of quantum physics contradict with each other with regard to how they describe particles. So why is quantum physics so problematic? So here we have, this is, ah, this is a nice thing. This is the helium quantum energy levels from quantum mechanics. So here you can see all the different states in which helium can be, and they can be calculated to an exactness of, I think, 20 digits behind the comma, Huge exactness just with the Schrödinger equation. This is the most, this is the most beautiful uh, model that the Schrödinger equation can make. I can't explain it here to you. It would make, take much too long, but it shows you that some things can be done with it quite accurately. That's a Feynman diagram of quantum electrodynamics with an electron. So that's that's a quantum, and it's again just a very few particles interacting. So um, I think I will, I think I will stop here and. You, tomorrow we'll have two more, three more slides about the metaphysical conclusions, and then I will, I will, will um, we will do particles. And um, uh, Tom, if you cannot come tomorrow, I don't know whether it's possible for you. I can send you the slides. Yeah. The yeah, slides. Yeah. No. I, when is it? When is our session? One to three thirty. So if you can, if you if you don't come, I don't. I, um, I will send it to you. Okay. Um, I, I can send it to you anyhow. And there is. The main paper that you need to read is um, is this one, Was sind subatomare Teilchen by Falkenburg. And I think you still will remember enough German to read it. And it, it, there, is no, there is no English version of it, but this is this is in the book Philosophy in Physics by Edith Baesfeld. This is an absolutely brilliant paper. And and this one, that, that, that basically I've just visualized this here so you can you can read this, and then you have the have this. And it's a it's a wonderful paper because it it shows that to what extent um, there are contradictions in the different theories of particles in quantum physics. And it does it in a it's it's on the one hand detailed, but on the other hand also very cool because she yeah you will see she compares it very well and points this out. And she's a bit at the end she doesn't know what to make out of it, but it but the substance is very good. Okay, so I hope it was not boring, and. Uh, <laughs> And so I. Uh, Some of it was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I'll see you tomorrow at one. Did you say, Barry? At uh, one yeah. o'clock. Yeah. Very good. See you again at one o'clock tomorrow. And so everyone yeah. should stay behind, and then we decide what to do about lunch and after lunch. <laughs>